I'm so happy that we are finally able to be back together in worship, even though we are spaced out, not spaced out, but spaced out with the COVID regulations. But welcome to Agape Discipleship Baptist Church. We are back in our building today. We were going to be out in the parking lot, but due to the heat, we decided to move inside and we are staying six feet apart and you can't see who's here but they are here I, i'm on camera but i can tell you we do have our people here and it's good that you are joining us on the video as well thank you for being part of our worship now if you would let us stand and sing our opening song see a victory Falls, it won't creep in. Cause the God I serve knows only how to try it. My God will never fail. Oh, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see the victory. I'm gonna see the victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see the victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant, cause I know how the story ends. Yes, I know how the story ends. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. My way through, worship my way through. You took what the enemy meant for evil, and you turned it for good. You turned it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Amen. With God's help, there's nothing that we cannot see a victory through if we just give it over to Him and allow Him to take control. Uh, you may be seated. This past week, the past few months, has been a rough time for our nation and for many of us. It's been hard to be apart from our church family for a couple months. And over the last week and a half or so, we've seen a lot of other issues come up, especially with the death of George Floyd and others in our nation. And we just want to come together as we begin worship and just come to God in prayer and pray for everything that's been going on. Pray that God will work on the hearts of all of us in this nation and throughout the world, and that God's will be done. So if you would join me, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious, loving Father, 
as we gather on this beautiful day that you have made for worship. Lord, we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ. We come together as human beings created in your image. And Lord, we know it's been difficult. We know that this pandemic has been hard on so many people's lives. So many have been unable to work, been unable to get out of their homes to do the things they normally would do. And it's worn down on them, Lord. It's been stressful. It's caused issues. But Lord, we know that there is going to be a victory and that victory will come through you, that you will lead us through this pandemic and help us to the other side, that you are using this situation for good as you've eliminated so many of the idols that have been in people's lives, that have been in the way of their relationship with you. And now, Lord, as we're coming to the end of this pandemic, coming where we see the light at the end of the tunnel, Help us to stay focused on you, to not allow those idols to come back in and take control. And Lord, with what's been going on in this nation over the last week and a half, with the death of George Floyd and, and others, with the rioting, Lord, we just place our nation in your hands. And we ask, Lord, that you work on the hearts of everyone, especially the Christians in this nation, that Christians will no longer be silent. But take a stand for your word. Your word says that all are equal. All are created in your image. And help us, Lord, as we go about our lives to live our lives. Dedicated to following your word. To being your disciples. To being your ambassadors on this earth. That we will take a stand for what's right. And that we will help this world to come. To a point where everyone will treat each other as an equal. Everyone will see each other as someone created in your image. Help us to make this a reality in this world, Lord. We place all of this in your hands and ask that you guide us and lead us. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> There's no one that is more powerful and has the ability to take care of everything going on in the world than Jesus. Amen? Amen. There's no name more powerful, and there's no one that we should put our faith in above Jesus. So let us now sing our worship song, Jesus. <laughs>
Messiah, my Savior. There is power in your name. You're my rock and my redeemer. There is power in your name, in your name. You walk on the waters, you speak. Stand in the fire beside me. You roll like a lion. You bled as a lamb. You carry my healing in your hand. Oh, you walk on the waters. You speak to the sea. You stand in the fire beside me. God, you. no one like you, Jesus. There is no one like you. Amen. Our reading today comes from 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. 1 John chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. And it says, Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Now, I had prepared to start a three-part study on Titus this week, but due to recent events, the Holy Spirit led me to today's scripture. And you'd have to be living under a rock, literally, to not know what's been going on in the last week or so in this country. With the death of George Floyd, with the riots that are going on. Many innocent people have lost their lives. There's been destruction. But our nation is angry. We're in protest over what's been going on. And it got me to thinking about my life and myself growing up. Yes, I am of European descent. I'm white. But as I was growing up, my parents never once said anything derogatory or anything racist toward anyone of a different color or a different nationality. And so as I was growing up, I never viewed anyone different from me. And I remember when I got to elementary school, when after I moved to Tennessee, when I was younger, we in Missouri, I moved to Tennessee, and around fifth grade, I think it was, I was eating lunch in the cafeteria, and I don't remember everything that was on the lunch, but I do remember tater tots was part of it because that's relevant to my story. I was sitting there, and there was another boy next to me who was looking at the tater tots, and there were some burn spots on the tater tots. And he would look at those burn spots on the tater tots, and he would use the N-word to describe them. I had never heard that word. So in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, that's... That must be what those burn spots are called. Because I'd never heard that word at all. And so I took a tater tot and I was 
happy with myself. I, now I know what to call this. And I point at the burnt spot on the tater tot and say, that's, and I use the N word. And at that point, I look up and there was an African American boy standing there and he heard me and he just stared at me with sadness and I had no idea what was going on. And looking back on that, it's a very shameful thing to happen. But I was completely naive. I had never heard that word before until that day. I didn't know what it meant. And my whole life I've tried to treat all people as equal. To not see them for their color. To see them as humans. And it really bothers me when someone would describe a person by the color of their skin when that has no relevance to the story whatsoever. But we of European descent have no idea what it's like for people of African descent or of other nationalities to grow up in a culture that has been shaped to be privileged toward white people. When I was in seminary, I had a class that opened my eyes to a lot of things. There were some ads run back in the 60s. And one of the posters I remember, it was saying, where was the black person at creation? And in the poster, you see God, you see Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and way off to the side, like animals, were a man and a woman that were African American. That is the culture that our parents grew up in and their parents grew up in. And when people learn a culture, they tend to teach their children the same culture that they grew up in. And so the issue of racism is passed down from father to son to grandson and on until someone takes a stand to stop it. There are many of you though out there watching today and maybe here among us that did not learn the way I did, did not have parents that, that raised you to respect all people and treat all people as equals. There are many out there who had parents that taught you that white people are better there are many out there that taught you that other people are, are lazy or they just want to live off the government. They don't want to better themselves, whatever the case. It needs to stop. The cycle has to stop. And I am doing everything I can to make sure that my children will never view someone or anything other than what's in that person's heart. Because that's the way God views us. And as Christians, that is how we should view others. As I mentioned, all of us are created in God's image. Doesn't matter where we're from, what color our skin is, we're all created in God's image. But what does our scripture then today that we read have to say about how we treat other human beings. Well, it says anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. As a Christian pastor, probably the one thing that would irritate me the most is someone who is part of one of these hate groups in the country and go to church on Sunday and proclaim their love for Christ. And then during the week, they're speaking hate toward their brothers and sisters. If someone claims to be a Christian, but yet they're showing hate toward other people, they are not a Christian. I don't care what they say, they're not. Christianity and racism are not compatible.
But it also says whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. Now, does that mean that there's nothing in us that love everyone that will cause us not to sin? No, that's not what it means. But what it means is there's nothing in you who love Christ, who profess your love and profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. There's nothing within a Christian that will cause them to go into the world of hate. <laughs> And then verse 11 says, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. Now, the darkness doesn't have to be sin. The darkness can be what we are taught by other generations of our family. People live in darkness because that is what they know. They don't know any better. That's how they've been taught. There's no excuse for it, but that's what they've been taught. You know, I took a class a year ago that had to do with generational poverty. And in that class, I learned that people who live in poverty, many of them are in poverty because their family has told them that's what they should do. And there are those who live in poverty that want to better themselves, that want to go to college, and want to have a career, and their family holds them back and tells them, you're betraying your family if you try to better yourself and get out of this situation. So it's not just a racist issue. It's also a culture issue. It's also a social class issue, whatever you want to call it. It's learned behavior. And I can't stop to ponder how many people who live in poverty are there because they were told they have to be. And how many of them may actually be brilliant and be able to really make a good life for themselves if they could just break that cycle and get out. As a child and as an adult, my favorite all-time TV show is the original Star Trek. And it's not just because it's in space. It's my favorite show because of the vision of the future it portrays. Where all people work together as equals, men and women, people of different nations. This show was on TV at a time when the Russians were our major enemy. There's a Russian part of the crew. It was a time when the civil rights movement was very heavy in this country. And there was an African American woman as part of the crew. It shows us a future that we as Christians want to have happen. But many of us are afraid to take a stand for it because we don't want to deal with all the negative things that come on us for doing that. But Star Trek Pro, it gives us a future that truly shows all people are equal. That we all have equal opportunity to succeed in this life, regardless of our culture, regardless of our nationality, regardless of our education, regardless of what state we come from, of how we speak. Many people throughout the years have been fans of that show. Many are fans because of the future it presents. And one of the greatest fans of that show back in the 60s was none other than Martin Luther King Jr. And Michelle Nichols, who played Uhura on Star Trek, she was having thoughts of leaving the show at one point because of the racist issue. She was African American, everything, everyone else was white, and she wasn't feeling treated equal on the show. And while she was thinking about leaving the show, Martin Luther King Jr. called her, and he talked with her. 
And she told him what she was feeling. She told him she was thinking of leaving because she was tired of dealing with all of it. And he said, no, you have to stay on that show. You have to stay on that show because you are a vision of hope for our people. You are a vision of what's going to happen in the future. And you need to stay there to show people that in the future, in the near future, hopefully, that our people will be equal with all people. And so because Martin Luther King Jr. called her and asked her to stay on that show, she did. And she became an image of hope for the African American people for what would come in the future. Now that future is something that I long for every day. As did Martin Luther King Jr., as do all true believers in Christ. And I'm going to read some from Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Because it also reflects on events of what's going on now and of his desire for that future that we just talked about. I'm not going to read the whole speech, but just some excerpts from it. At one point he says, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. This note was a promise that all men, yes, black men as well as white men, would be guaranteed the unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds. And then he says, but we refuse to believe that the bank of justice is bankrupt. He says, now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. And it would be fatal for the nation to overlook the urgency of the moment. Skipping down, he says, there will be neither rest nor tranquility in America until the Negro is granted his citizenship rights. Skipping farther down, he says, there are those who are asking the devotees of civil rights, when will you be satisfied? We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied as long as our bodies, heavy with fatigue of travel, cannot gain lodging in the motels of the highways and the hotels of the city. He says, we cannot be satisfied as long as our basic mobility is from a smaller ghetto to a larger one. We can never be satisfied as long as our children are stripped of their selfhood and robbed of their dignity by signs stating, for whites only. And skipping farther down, he says, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even in the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. That was Dr. King's speech, some of it. That was in 1963, a hundred years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. <clears throat> this is now 2020. We are 57 years later. Have we really progressed much beyond 
where we were when he gave that speech. <laughs> the Christian responsibility in the world is not just to be a people of words, but a people of action. And I'm going to read 1 John chapter 3, verse 18, which says, Dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. To put that in layman's terms, let us be the light. Let us not just say what we believe. Let us not just say what we stand for. Let us live it out in how we live our lives. If the church is to truly be the light of Christ in the world, if we take on that responsibility, we will reach that glorious future that Dr. King talked about in his speech and that the show Star Trek was all about. It will be fulfilled for people all across the globe, regardless of the color of their skin or who they are, where they come from, what language they speak, what gender they are. It will be fulfilled. But to be people who truly follow Christ, and this is important, so I want everyone to pay attention to this. If we are truly following Christ, if we truly make that commitment to be a follower of Christ, we must be the same person during the week that we are on Sunday morning when we're in worship. We cannot be a different person on Sunday than we are during the week. We cannot proclaim love for Jesus on Sunday and then be a worldly person during the week. If we are to truly follow Christ, we have got to be a follower of Christ 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Anything less exposes us as false disciples. I hate to put it so blunt, but it's the truth. If we're not going to follow Christ 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're not a follower at all. Let us, as followers of Christ, as the church, stand up for the morality and all of God's love and mercy and compassion that is written in the pages of God's book. Let us not be afraid to stand for what's right. Even in the face of opposition, even in the face of ridicule, nothing will change unless there's a change in the hearts of people. And there will not be a change in the hearts of people unless the followers of Christ go out and speak to the people about Christ. You, know, you can preach to someone till you're blue in the face, but until there's a change in their heart, they will remain the same person they've been. But they will never hear about the gospel if we don't go out and talk to them. But the only way to make sure that that future we all strive for becomes a reality is to live out our faith every day. Is to be willing to share our faith with others. Let us not remain silent. Christianity over the past few decades has gotten to a point where we've become rather complacent in where we are and that's allowed the world to come in and kind of take over. We do not exist to allow the world to come in and tell the church what to do. The church is supposed to go out and tell the world about Christ. And if we are allowing the world to tell people what's right and what's wrong... 
That's on us. That's on us. And that brings up the book of Ezekiel. And in Ezekiel it says, if your neighbor is doing something wrong and you do not do anything to help correct them, then their blood is on your hands. But if they're doing something wrong and you take steps to help them see their way and correct them and they still choose not to follow that path, you've done your job. Their blood would then be on their hands. But what does that mean? That means if we see people are not living the way they should live and we as Christians do not try to help disciple them and lead them in the path they should go, then their blood is on our hands for not taking that step. Ultimately, it's all of our own choice on which path we follow. But as for me and my house, we choose to serve the Lord. Now, Jesus Christ, and I'm going to bring this up as well. Uh, this past week, I saw a quote. Someone had put on Facebook something about all you white people like quoting Dr. King about being nonviolent. Well, you killed him. Well, you know what? The greatest champion of nonviolence in the history of Earth was Jesus Christ. And guess who killed him? People that weren't even different skin color than him. And that was because he was a threat. And when people threaten the status quo, the people in power feel threatened. And then that makes you an enemy because you are taking a stand for what's right. And the people in power don't want to lose their power. So they do everything they can to silence the voices of the people who take the stand for what's right. That's what happened to Jesus. That's what happened to Martin Luther King Jr. That's what happened to all these people that are martyrs for what's right. And Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he was with his disciples in the upper room, and he used that Passover meal to inform them about what he was about to do for them, and not just for them, but for every human being that's ever lived, from Adam to the last person that will ever live, what Jesus did for all of them. While they were eating, he took the bread, and he broke the bread, and he gave it to his disciples, and he said, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which is broken for you. When the supper was ended, he took the cup, and he lifted it up to heaven and gave thanks and praise, and he gave the cup to the disciples and said, take this all of you and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the new covenant. My blood will be shed for you and for all, so that sins may be forgiven. Every time you drink of this cup, remember me. Now, in a few moments, we will be participating in the Lord's Supper. The only requirement to participate is to have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Now here we're going to do it for those who are with us in worship today. We have it separated by household, so everyone will just touch the area that is designated for their household. But for those of you at home that would like to participate, you can get your own bread and your own juice, and you can participate with us that way. So I will call one family at a time to come forward and, and get their elements, get their, their bread and their juice, which is up here separated by household. And then we will go back to our seats and then we'll commune together once everyone's been served. Body of Christ broken. Blood of Christ shed for you.
Let us all stand as we sing our closing hymn, Amazing Grace. determination to be the light of Christ in this world. Mother Teresa told us, how do you save the world? It's one person at a time. Let us go forth then, one person at a time, sharing the love and the light of Christ, changing one life at a time, which will lead to an ultimate future where all people shine in the light of Christ and have the ability to live the life that God has created them to live. And it's in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ we pray. Amen.